All righty. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're uh, really excited that you're all here. Um, this conference has actually been a uh, something that I've been going to for, I don't know, six, seven, eight years since I started working with transfer students. And a lot of what we are doing here today that you'll see what they were doing came out of sessions that I've, I've been to here or conversations I've had with people. Um, so I just, in general, want to send out good vibes to all the transfer people who have helped me as we've planned all the, everything that we're doing in LSA because it has been a really important part of what we do. Um, so uh, today what we're going to cover here is our tra a transfer student center at both ends of the bridges. We use the bridge metaphor as our metaphor for working with our transfer students from the time that they think about transferring to the University of Michigan into the College of Literature, Science and the Arts through their transition and then on through to uh, successful completion of their degree. Um, we do have a physical transfer student center. That's not necessarily going to be the focus of our presentation here today. We're going to focus more on the initiatives and, and things that we're doing that you could do at any school, even if you don't have a physical center, but are based on the idea that the same people are working with prospective transfer students who then work with those students once they get on the campus, which is uh, in some ways, I think kind of a unique thing is that that's what we all do. We work with students throughout that time. So. Um, we are, the, uh, we are in student recruitment in the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts. I'll say a little bit more about what that means in a minute. Um, we are in the Division of Undergraduate Ed. So we're, we're not admissions, even though we do the bulk of our work with prospective transfer students at our Michigan Community Colleges and some out-of-state community college partners. We have our transfer team uh, is a staff of four. Um, and so we cover the state. Um, and then we have 24 student transfer student ambassadors who also work with us to do uh, staff our transfer student center and do some of our recruitment efforts. Like I said, we're not admissions. We don't have to read applications, thankfully. Um, sorry, I don't mean to disparage any of you who are admissions here, right? Probably shouldn't have said it that way. Okay, I apologize. So, all right. Um, so um, I'm Michael Hartman. I'm the assistant director of LSA Student Recruitment for Transfer Initiatives and Partnerships. So I direct the transfer recruitment efforts for the college um, and also direct the operations of our transfer student center and then the rest of the team. Hello, my name is Dallas Mickey Henry. I'm LSA transfer student ambassador. I transferred from Oakland Community College uh, in 2020. Um, so I got to the University of Michigan in 2020 of January and I just graduated two months ago. So December of 2021. Y'all are too nice, uh, uh, but it was a giant accomplishment. Uh, pretty happy, but um, sticking around at the university right now, finishing up a lot of my efforts on helping transfer students um, with LSA recruitment, but also on Optimize, uh, which is a student-led student organization on campus, which has a sector into uh, helping transfer students. So uh, I'm here to just help transfer students. I'm trying to be the person that I needed when I was a transfer student, and uh, I want to finish that work before I venture off into the world. All right, hello everybody. My name is Darion Blaylock. I work as a transfer recruiting coordinator for our office. Um, previous, um, prior to this role, I worked as a academic advisor at a community college in the state. Um, and so I've been in this role for actually almost a year now and like a couple weeks. Hello everyone, my name is Justin Villanueva. I'm a transfer recruiting coordinator at the College of LSA, um, but also uh, I'm a community college graduate and I transferred to the University of Michigan back in 2015 as a 34 year old husband and father who was working full time and owned my own home and all of that. I uh, got my bachelor's degree in sociology at the University of Michigan and went on to uh, get my master's in higher education with a focus on student success and access at the University of Michigan School of Education. All right, so what we're going to talk about today is uh, just brief introductions of the University of Michigan, sort of where LSA sits, a little bit about our transfer student populations, um, a brief timeline of the transfer student center, as I mentioned, we do want to talk about it a bit, but it's not really the focus of our presentation here. Um, I am actually doing, I think I'm doing tomorrow afternoon, one of the discussions with the transfer center directors. Um, so if you want to learn more about how we actually function and how we established our transfer student center, I'll be able to say more about that during that session tomorrow. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit, Dallas and, and Darion are going to talk about an effort that they're piloting to include our transfer ambassadors more in our recruitment efforts by going out to the community colleges together. Justin's going to cover 
um, begin to talk about self-authorship, which is something that he brought to our team as a way of sort of bringing a theory to what many of the things that we are already doing, and then he's going to tell you how he applies that to the non-traditional uh, student community group that he started recently. And then we're going to talk a little bit about our mentorship program um, for prospective transfer students. All right. Now, the University of Michigan is Carnegie Research One Public University, 19 schools and colleges, 14 of which uh, have undergraduate students, 32,000 roughly undergrad population of that LSA as the largest of the undergraduate units, as is true at most uh, schools, arts and sciences. We have roughly 18,000 of those students. Transfer students for the university as a whole are about 4,500. We have 71% of the transfer students on campus are in LSA. Okay, that's a measure of the size of LSA, but also that we have a very strong commitment to recruiting, supporting, and retaining our transfer students. Um, and so we have more transfer students than the other um, units on campus. Uh, now, a little bit about the admissions of our transfer students. We are a selective university. And I started with the first year class profile numbers up there, because those actually mean a lot to us as we work with uh, prospective transfer students, because our prospective transfer students have seen those numbers, particularly in-state students, and they're scared by those numbers. And they get to their community college and they say, Mich University of Michigan's not for me, because I didn't have a 3.9 GPA. I didn't, you know, I didn't take the ACT, things like that. And so that is something that we are actually struggling against in our recruitment of transfer students from our in-state community colleges. Our LS. Um, LSA transfer class um, profile, you know, we, we are a selective university. Our, the average GPA for our transfer students is typically around 3.7, um, but we do have a decent high, decently high admission rate, 54% overall, 61% in-state. So it's not as difficult to get in, it, uh, be admitted as a transfer student as it is first year student in terms of the percentages, okay? Now, uh, we are perhaps unique in a little bit that most of our transfer students actually come from other four-year schools, okay? Only 27% of our transfer students come from community colleges. That's a, that's a number we're trying to increase, and I'll say a little bit about, more about that in a minute, but that's the nature of what we're looking at. So in recruitment, when we're work, working with prospective students, our active efforts are to recruit community college students but we work with a lot of students transferring from other four-year schools as well. All right, now a little bit about our transfer student population. Our transfer student population is more diverse than our first-year population, and very significantly in some measures. So in, in our community college transfer population is even more diverse than the general population. So you can point out, you can see the numbers, um, and you can just quickly see the trajectory of these numbers. But the one thing I do want to point out is this big gap right here, okay? So even, even though the number, of, the percentage of our community college transfer students who are black or African, black and African American is 7%, the state of Michigan's percentage is 14%, okay? So this is a big gap right here that you know, a lot of our efforts are going towards meeting the needs of those students. And Dr. Pink talked about those students today in his presentation. And we are really trying to figure out how to not just bring those students to campus, but then help them succeed after they get here. Because their, their success rates, which I don't have a slide for, is, I'll use the word significantly, even though that doesn't mean statistically significant, because I haven't done the study, but significantly lower than the success rates for our other community college transfer students. So that's, and then our, our Transfer student um, are also uh, much more diverse in terms of low income students. So 43% of our community college students, for example, are Pell eligible students. 25% are first gen, 16% are over 24, and this is when they enter the university, all these numbers. So um, you can see, so our transfer population is a population that made up a, a higher percentage of students who has, are historically underserved by the university. And so in our efforts in student recruitment, one of the things that we're trying to do is meet those students at the other side of the bridge to help them get successfully over the bridge, but not just over the bridge, 
into, but into degree completion, okay? And so we do a lot of pre-transfer advising. We do one-on-one -on -one advising with students, create a transfer guide, things like that. But this is what, this is the population that we're trying to serve, and so we're really dedicating ourselves to programming to do that in a, in a variety of different ways. Okay, now uh, those are the numbers. I'm gonna turn it over to Dallas. Those are really awkward. <laughs> To talk a little bit about the transfer student experience at U of M. Thank you, Michael. Um, transfer student experience um, is like so many like facets and levels to the transfer student experience. Uh, working with transfer students, I'm pretty sure that you all have heard similar stories, but I feel like not all stories are the same. Um, I know mine had a lot of similarities, but also had a lot of differences considering when I transferred and how I transferred. Um, but coming from a community college and now going to the university, the university of Michigan, it was 2020, January, winter semester. I'm like, this is going to be my year at this new university. This is going to 2020 is going to be the year, and we all knew what happened <laughs> in 2020. So um, I had to, you know, of course, go home uh, after two and a half months on campus. Um, but even before that, the transition was extremely rocky from going from a community college to a university um, on so many different levels. Uh, it was so many times I just felt alone. I felt I didn't belong. I was not smart enough. I transferred in to some classes with like 18 year olds who were like really knew what they were talking about. And I'm like, whoa, I don't know if I'm smart enough for this school. Then I went to some classes with other 21 year olds like myself at that time. And they really knew what they were talking about in some of these classes. I'm like, uh, I don't know if uh, this is for me like at all. And then it's U of M, so it's a pretty competitive school on terms like academics. Uh, and I, I don't know, so many moments when I transferred that I really like, questioned myself. And then even just looking at some of the people in my class um, who were children of doctors and lawyers and former presidents and um, pop stars, but like some of their friends like really have money and my dad works at Sam's Club. So I'm, I'm like, I don't have the strongest of a financial background. Um, so even on a term of like on a financial situation, I don't fit in with a lot of the students here. Then also I was a black man on campus and <laughs> it was not a lot of us on campus. And it was just so many different factors where I'm like, I don't, I don't think this is for me, but I kept telling myself that things are going to get better, and eventually they did. Um, and a lot of it <laughs> kind of happened because of the pandemic. Uh, but g after getting sent home, I got opened up to a lot of opportunities with student recruitment and with other organizations such as like Optimize. They even like when I came back to the university, speaking with Justin again, the non-traditional group, which you're going to hear about later. All that stuff started, and just talking to more transfer students, things eventually just got better. That was just a very brief um, experience. If y'all want to talk a little bit more, um, I'll give you a whole, a whole paper. All right. Thanks, Dallas. And, and um, so in regard to our Transfer Student Center, um, we did actually open in January of 2020. Um, Dallas is famous because he was a commuter student, so he was in the Transfer Student Center four days a week. Studying Greek is the big joke because he was taking intensive Greek and he hated it. And so, um, but uh, but uh, so we opened in 2020. It all sort of started back in 2016 when the College of LSA established their Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Strategic Plan, which for the first time named recruiting, retaining, and transfer student as a goal of the college. That's the very first time that the college ever had anything specific about this is a population that we want to serve. This is a population that we're not currently serving well and we need to do something about it, okay? So at that time, we had the, part of that was just a numbers goal that we'd increase the transfer students to 1,200 transfer students a year in five years. Um, and I'll have a slide in a minute to show you we were at about 700 at that time. But also to better serve those students, to make sure that they, as Dr. Pink said, not that they survive, but they thrive, okay? Um, and so that's an effort. So in recruitment, we try to do that by helping them get to the point where they're successfully transferring, where they don't lose credits 
where they can make connections with people on campus even while they're still at their previous institution. So when they get to campus, they have a great transition. Okay. Uh, and then the success of, whoops, oh, too many. The success of our recruitment efforts can be seen here. So, you know, we, had, we started at 700 in 2016. This year we had almost 1,300 transfer students come in. Our success rate for our transfer students in terms of retention and completion has remained roughly the same. We are, we're at about 94% over the last 10 years, meaning that students are either graduating or if they haven't reached the point of graduation yet, they are still attending classes. So our transfer students are successful. Um, in this timeline, though, you know, we're here talking about the Transfer Student Center as, at both ends of the bridges, but you can see this was all happening way before we had a Transfer Student Center, okay? But the college had a number of efforts going on that led to our Transfer Student Center. In 2017, we applied for a Mellon Foundation grant and received that in 2018 to create a program called Transfer Bridges to the Humanities with Henry Ford College, one of our uh, community college partners nearby. Uh, and at that same time, the Transfer Student Center was approved. Um, and it was approved as a part of a very large construction project that added 30,000 square feet to the back of the LSA building and renovated the rest of the building, which meant it was approved in 2018. And then there was construction for two years, okay? And that's why it was approved then, but we didn't open until 2020. Um, and then we closed and opened and closed and opened and closed because of the pandemic. Finally, 2020, we got open for good and we're still open today. And we uh, just received an extension to our Mellon Foundation grant that is allowing us to expand everything that we do with the, just the one college to Grand Rapids Community College and to Schoolcraft College, okay? But all this time, we've been serving transfer students in the same way that we do now really with a transfer center without a transfer student center just by sort of having a uh, specific group of people who are working with the students to really help them plan their transfer, and then also being there as familiar faces when they get to campus. Okay, and then again, um, our goal of increasing the community college student um, was part of the DEI initiative too. You can see we've been successful. Um, however, this is the exact same percentage of number of transfer students. 2017, that was 27% of all of our transfer students. 2022, that's 27% of all of our transfer students. And that's not what we were trying to do. Okay, we're, as I mentioned, the majority of our students come from four-year schools. We want that percentage of community college students to be higher. So over the last year or so, we've been fortunate that the college is funding positions in transfer recruitment so that we now have enough staff that we are spending when we can get to campuses are spending more time at each campus. Our goal is to be at each of our 28 community colleges once a month. Um, and with our larger community colleges that are closer by, even maybe once a week. Um, and so that we really have a presence there, we can get to know students and really work with the students and the staff and the faculty at our uh, community colleges in a more, much more you know, high touch way, high impact way. And all right, and then the way that we do ha use the Transfer Student Center in our recruitment, ha since we have it, is the Transfer Student Center website um, is, has all the information for prospective transfer students, has how, you, how they apply, has our transfer guides for our 28 community colleges, has you know, uh, information about how transfer credit counts for the LSA degree, what the general degree requirements are, how students can figure all that out. Um, it, it host, uh, you know, we host information sessions and things of that sort. There's the ambassadors have a page so students can reach out uh, to, to the ambassadors to ask questions about the student experience. And then they can also make individual advising appointments right through the, um, through the uh, website. So just in terms of numbers, that's something that we launched at, during COVID is virtual um, individual advising appointments. And as you can see, it was very popular. In 2021, we had advising appointments with over a thousand students, um, prospective transfer students. So that was very popular. Um, and then our transfer students ambassadors, who are the staff of the Transfer Student Center, are a, a huge resource for our prospective transfer students in a whole bunch of different ways. Okay, and Dallas can talk more about that in a minute. And then I'll talk more about mentorship at the end. And then we also believe having the physical space on campus where transfer students can get to campus 
see something as their own, okay? Does resonate with, with people that we talk to, resonates with prospective students, resonates with the community college faculty and staff about our commitment to helping transfer students with a successful transition. So that's sort of the role that the physical space kind of plays in all of our efforts that were, as I said, were actually going on before we ever had the transfer student center. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Darian, talk a little bit about all right, so uh, we have transfer student ambassadors and they play a critical role in our efforts as Michael mentioned. So our transfer student ambassadors are all current students at the university who transfer from either a two year or four year college. And the vast majority of those um, transfer student ambassadors are actually from our in-state um, community colleges. Um, so uh, they play a role in both our in-person and online recruiting. Um, online, they help us in a number of our efforts. So uh, one of our efforts they help us with is our um, our transfer information sessions. So sometimes they participate in those sessions. They also do transfer student panels where they share their experiences in both pre and post transfer with prospective transfer students. And finally, sometimes they'll uh, respond to some student inquiries uh, via email. Um, additionally, uh, as Michael mentioned uh, early in the agenda, uh, one of the things that we've been uh, doing uh, this past year is uh, we started a pilot where we bring our transfer student ambassadors who are alumni of our in-state community colleges with us on our college visits. So I've been the one fortunate to start this pilot as we have uh, four current students from uh, one of our largest in-state community colleges, Oakland Community College. So that campus has, um, that college has five campuses. Um, so Dallas and a number of his peers have been with me on those visits. Um, so uh, given that we just started this in this apply, there's no tangible data for it yet, but um, we have some observations and some kind of anecdotal evidence um, based on our experiences this past semester. So um, one of the things that we had is, uh, that we thought was important was community college representation at U of M. So oftentimes in our experience, so uh, as I mentioned, I worked previously as a academic advisor at a community college um, in state with one of the schools we recruit at. Um, so oftentimes in my experience as an advisor and in this role, students oftentimes think that being at a community college um, hinders their chances for admission, that it's a sort of a stigma. Um, so part of that is uh, us addressing that stigma on our end, um, and then also having students who are actually at the university so that they can realize that there are individuals like them who share their background and identities at the university already. Um, Next, uh, we realize the importance of peer relationships and networking. So not only is it important for you to see individuals that look like you or share experiences like you at an institution, it's important to also be able to connect with those individuals. So um, for us, it's important to bring our transfer student ambassadors with us because uh, oftentimes as we are all higher ed uh, professionals, we know that students sometimes utilize their peers uh, more than they utilize faculty and staff for information. So. For us, we think it's important not only to be able to connect with an individual, but also be able to speak to an individual who has accurate information. Um, next, uh, in my experiences with uh, Dallas and our other transfer student ambassadors, they can really serve, uh, they can really assist us in building relationships with the community college stakeholders. So they're a bit unique um, as a group as they were all very highly actively involved on campus. So every time we were on campus, the uh, faculty and staff always recognized them before they recognized me, even though I had on university apparel. <laughs> So, <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah, they always recognize these individuals, but that's really helpful because it allows us to figure out who are the stakeholders and who are like the game changers at those institutions. Because as we all know, sometimes it can be hard figuring out who's the right person to speak to and who's the person to get information to. Um, Dallas will speak a little bit more about that in a second. Um, so yeah, I mean, the individuals I was able to meet through Dallas and uh, our other transfer student ambassadors are deans, um, program advisors, um, individuals who are like the head of facilities. So oftentimes my visits, they might tell me that, hey, they, the person that, uh, that I'm in communication with who told me where to be in the visit, they say, actually, you should probably go there because you'll probably get more student traffic. So those type of things are important as we go in these um, colleges because we're recruiters at the end of the day, so only spend a uh, finite amount of times on these campuses. Um, finally, we believe um, insider knowledge is important. So utilizing, uh, utilizing our alumni to figure out what type of uh, things we, could have do we can do as an institution to make the college more accessible and to help ease the process, both uh, pre and post transfer is important. So oftentimes I ask them their experiences um, as we were on our visits and also our uh, post visit just to know like, hey, what do you all think I can do uh, to attract more students to the table? What kind of information can I provide them that's useful? So uh, Dallas is gonna go ahead and share his experiences with both uh, kind of peer relationships and also um, the importance of, peer, of uh, insider knowledge. Thank you, Darion. And like Darion mentioned, I was a very active student at OCC. I was a student ambassador there. I also worked in the student life office. I worked in their tutoring center. I worked at a front desk a few times, but I was just all about networking when I was at OCC. So actually kind of like 
I don't like boost my ego too much, but like having me there was beneficial because I knew almost like everyone at the school from janitors to chancellors um, because I talk to janitors, but also I've done press conferences with the chancellor. So um, just being involved on campus and having uh, students like myself, because uh, my peers were also very involved at the campus, um, having us connect Darion to who he needed to talk to, um, I feel like definitely helped with trying to plan out future events, but like what we could do better. But that peer-to-peer -peer relationship is like so important because like even thinking about it sometimes, you ask uh, your friends for advice before you ask your parents for advice. Uh, so actually uh, speaking to someone who is your age, who's been in your shoes, who's doing some things that you wanna do, um, having them explain to you like, this is actually very accessible. Uh, I was in your shoes and um, I made it to the University of Michigan. Uh, we even had a specific student, and it was kind of weird. He had the same exact first semester lineup classes that I had, um, and it was his first semester. And uh, I was a film major. I graduated uh, when my associate and my bachelor's in film, and he was too. But like one of the classes was like a, a, a folk religion class, and like you took that random class too, your first semester. But it was just like we had the same exact lineup, like schedule. We had the same exact dreams, the same exact pathways, and like just, I don't know, it was, just like, it was weird. I was like looking in the mirror, like, wow, that was me when I was there in 2016. Um, but he came back to a table visit once, and we were at a different campus. But he saw us, he stopped by, he asked for questions, got his email, we've been following up with him. But he was just a, an example, because he was me. But we had other students do that on like different occasions where we would come to the campus and they'll see us again, follow up with us, or just have a, a, a conversation with us at the table. Um, so that peer-to-peer -peer is extremely important, and I'm gonna get on the soapbox for like two seconds, but um, if you wanna work with transfer students uh, and actually benefit transfer students, and you do not have transfer students on your team, you gotta get them on your team. Um, working with the stakeholder is phenomenal. Uh, communicating with the stakeholder is also phenomenal, but if you really want to improve transfer students, you're not having transfer students put in some work to improve their community, um, you might wanna suggest doing that. Communicating with stakeholders is a big thing with me, something I really learned from uh, Optimize, um, but we definitely have to communicate with the community. Representation matters when you're trying to defend that community. I'm off my soapbox. Uh, handing it back over to Michael. Thanks, Dallas. All right, and then the Transfer Student Center also on, on the other side of the bridge of the students getting there is there to provide support for the transfer students once they're on campus and a space for community for our transfer students. So our Transfer Student Center, um, you know, the website has information for our perspective, for our current transfer students, connecting them, the information about housing and, and things like that, all the nuts and bolts types of things. Um, it is a physical space for our transfer students to hang out in. Um, there's a fridge, microwave, so students can store their food for the day, things like that. Um, and um, so it's, it can be a, a spot for community. Um, we host workshops, so we have study abroad and a lot of our off-campus programs and things like that will come in um, and do workshops specifically for transfer students. We have some community partners, some campus partners that are really strong trans transfer uh, student programs, optimizes one, which is social innovation program. They actually have uh, nights, they call Amplify Nights, where they, for transfer students, where transfer students can come, and the big benefit is they get free food, but they also get community. Um, and so, um, so that's one. And then our we have a transfer mentorship program that's uh, run through a different office, and they do uh, every other week gatherings too in the Transfer Student Center. So we sort of host different groups. Our Student Veterans of America's chapter meets there every Wednesday, things like that. So it's a spot for transfer students to commune, okay, in a lot of different ways. Um, and then Justin um, sort of, ho Justin hosts his non-traditional student group in there, as you'll know, or as you'll know in a minute, as you, after you listen to him. Um, so, um, and then the, the transfer student center wall, like sort of a sign of the community is, um, our students like to write welcoming messages to each other. Um, and, and all that sort of demonstrates the diversity of our transfer students and they do it in all different languages. Um, 
and they're adding to it all the time. Um, so it's great. And then they put up silly polls like is a hot dog a taco or a sandwich, things like that, best places to study. Um, and so it's really their space to make their own. Um, and it's staffed by our transfer ambassadors. So there's always two ambassadors there at least. Um, and that way if people have questions or someone needs to go someplace on campus, our ambassadors will walk them there as opposed to just telling them where it is. Um, just because we are a fairly large campus and students in their first week sometimes get lost. And so it's nice to have someone friendly that can actually walk them over to someplace. All right, and then I mentioned our non-traditional student group. So I'm gonna turn it over to Justin to talk about self-authorship, um, which as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a theory that he sort of brought to our office when he started working with us um, and really taught me all about it. And it really made sense of how we should be looking at our work with transfer students and it's helped us begin to think about what we want to do next um, connected to the theory of self-authorship -author as sort of a guiding force if you want to think of it that way. So Justin. Thank you Michael. Uh, and so to begin with I'd like to talk about just to begin with with the goals um, that we want um, that for using self-authorship. Um, so the first goal is to understand the development of college transfer students, both within their individual experience as well as within the context that they're experiencing, um, that they're experiencing that development. And two, to create best practices to promote and increase the achievement of key learning outcomes through meaning-making structures such as critical thinking and complex reasoning. Um, we help students to pr and promote their journeys towards self-authorship through support. You're going to be hearing that throughout the rest of this presentation. And I just want to start out with this one quote from Marcia Baxter Magolda, is that under conditions of low support, students function less skillfully and perform at their functional level, which is adequate for their everyday functioning, but does not demonstrate their full potential. When students receive high support, however, they can perform at their optimal level, demonstrating their best, their best possible performance. And so with that, self-authorship is a theory of human development created in the constructivist uh, tradition of the discipline of psychology. Meaning making is a key but not sufficient um, component that helps people to go from an external dependent way of thinking to an internal independent disposition. As they journey towards self-authorship, people go from a socializing mind to a self-authoring mind by increasing their ability to think independently and um, to increase their capacities for critical thinking and complex reasoning. The trajectory of a student's uh, journey from the external orientation to the internal one is known as the subject-object -object relationship in which the individual is the subject. And what they think about becomes more and more an object um, outside of themselves. Most people are a mixture of both internal and external orientations. This is known as the crossroads. And as you can see from the, from the slide here, the swirling represents the development. Uh, that development is not linear, but often has uh, moments of growth or transition and retrenchment, consolidation. Self-authorship assumes that learning and development happen within the individual and within the context that they're learning. For colleges and universities, understanding and assessing student learning in the context of higher education requires attention to the learner's characteristics and to situational and contextual situ uh, characteristics, not one or the other. And as you can see from this Venn diagram that we have up here, meaning making is multidimensional and self-authorship consists of three areas. Knowledge, how one knows, how one knows what they know. Identity, how they know um, who they are as individuals. And then also relationships, how one relates to others. Um, as the individual moves towards self-authorship, three questions must be answered in relation to these areas or work towards being answered. One, how do I know what I know? Who am I? And how do I relate to others? And so to answer these questions, both transfer and non-traditional students must create meaning-making structures uh, that support complex reasoning and independent judgments. Meaning-making structures, or habits of mind, serve as interpretive filters, ways in which students think 
about things and how they come to the conclusions that they come to. Among these meaning-making structures include, but are not limited to, the one that I feel is the most important that we use in, in our program, self-reflection, considering others' assumptions and perspectives, discern patterns and anomalies, and apply methods of inquiry. There are five assumptions to self-authorship that we apply to transfer and non-traditional students. So the first assumption is that meaning-making structures are, are ordered from simple to complex. So for many of the students that are coming to the LSA, they have experienced already the, comp the complexities of life and, and can contribute these experiences towards their time at the university. Number two is that meaning-making structures evolve over time. So due to their age and life experience, both tra transfer and non-traditional students, the evolution process of their meaning-making structures may be more developed when they come to campus, um, which supplies more context from which to draw from as they move towards completing their degrees. Number three is that meaning-making develops through cycles of differentiation, deconstructing uh, how one thinks, and integration, reconstructing meaning-making structures or habits of mind. So for us at LSA, we strive to provide a safe environment where transfers and non-traditional students go, can go through these cycles of differentiation and integration, both from their past and present, as well as old and new experiences. Number four, meaning-making is a gradual process process and because it's gradual conflict and meaning making structures can arise and so for us transfer and non-traditional um, adjustment to new college environments can be gradual and may experience what we call transfer conflict so this is something that's well studied um, when it comes to transfer students is that generally in their first semester that they go to a uh, that they transfer to a college or university they generally dip in their college performance um, but then if they if they stick it out and they don't stop out, um, after that, generally after that first semester or first year, they level back up um, to their previous performance and they're generally right there or above traditional um, students at the university. And then finally, number five, meaning making develops, meaning, meaning making development rarely unfolds smoothly. So since the adjustment to these new schools rarely unfolds smoothly, support is our mission. We have to be there for our transfer and non-traditional students. So one way that, um, that another way that we provide support is that we came up with the non-traditional student community group. This is a passion project of mine, being a non-traditional student at the University of Michigan. Um, it began in fall 2021, and about 42 students um, are part of this group. So the vision of this group is that every non-traditional student that attends the University of Michigan is fully supported as they meet the challenges and opportunities of adult life while attending the University of Michigan and completing their degree. Our mission from this is to support current and non-traditional uh, students um, as they navigate their time at U of M by offering an environment where they can identify, develop, and strengthen their sense of self and their ability to determine their own path and to connect their experience at U of M with their external relationships and responsibilities. We do not believe that they stop being parents or stop being workers or anything like that. When they come onto campus, they bring all those identities with them and we want them there. There are five principles that we have modeled after the assumptions of uh, self-authorship with uh, the NTCG. And as a one, this is a self this is a self centered, a student centered, uh, is student centered. We recognize that each student is their own person and has distinct learning needs, interests, aspirations, and cultural and social backgrounds. Every student is on a unique learning path. We understand that learning involves the development of the individual and occur and occurs with within their unique context. Three, every student's path is different. Um, therefore, we will engage with one another with respect, understanding, patience, and most importantly, grace. Um, we're going to provide a growth mindset in this community. We will strive to see every challenge as an opportunity to grow. And the last principle, support, support, support. We as a community and as individuals will do everything we can to provide a supportive environment for every student that is part of this group. 
And so there are, um, we offer two strategies that provide um, non-traditional students the opportunity to come together and to practice the meaning-making structure um, of reflection among others. Um, and so the two cognitive strategies that we use is uh, one that um, transfer and non-traditional students experience their experiences are social and cultural capital. So this is an idea that I learned. In, um, I'm a sociology major from New at Michigan, and I learned about these two theories. And, and what it is is uh, social and cultural capital help to, um, to understand the trends of certain um, populations within society of who gets to be in power, who's marginalized, who gets to gain wealth, who doesn't, who gets to gain an education, who doesn't. And they recognize these through cultural and social aspects of how people grow up. Okay, and so what I did though is I remember when I was in class, um, we were learning about criminology and we we're talking about gangs and how gangs socialize and the culture within gangs. And I got to share an I got to share a story about myself about how when I was 13 years old I joined a gang, and I participated in a um, in a um, in a ritual of getting beat in, where 10 to 12 uh, gang members just beat the heck out of me, and then at the end of it I was part of that gang. As I noticed, just like now, everyone in the class was looking at me. And I noticed that this story had power, that it, it brought context to the class, that I was contributing to the knowledge that we we're trying to produce and trying to understand. And from that moment, I realized that my experience, whether it was good or bad, growing up in, a, in, in poverty, not having a dad, all that was cultural and social capital that I can bring to my university. And so I tell every non-traditional student, no matter what you have gone through, no matter what you've done, it's all good stuff. Stuff is great to bring to this university so that we can then extend knowledge and help society. Then the other one is building your fan club. I often reflected on my um, experience at the University of Michigan and how I actually got through. And there was three types of people that I, I surrounded myself with. The first one is support from family and friends. Whether they understood what I was trying to do or not, um, I stopped trying to convince certain family members and friends of what I was doing, and I just went to the friends and family um, that supported me no matter what, whether they understood or not. The second one is um, to uh, I surrounded myself with people who understood what I was trying to do and can help me get there. People like Michael Hartman, the Transfer Student Center. My, my counselors, my advisors, all those people, they were all part of my fan club. Oh, I pr probably forgot to introduce that. I called it building your fan club. It's kind of like uh, transfer champions. And the last one is support from those who inspire and are, um, are in the field of interest. And so I surrounded myself with people who inspired me. I learned right away that I wanted to be in higher education. So I, I surrounded myself with people in higher education. So I tell non-traditional students, build your fan club. And by the way, I'm your number one fan. And there are two communal strategies that we do. Um, we offer community events throughout the semester. Every At the beginning of every semester, we hold an NTCG kickoff event for brand new non-traditional students who have matriculated to the university. As well as we do activities throughout the semester. An example that we have right here, we have non-traditional students and their families painting the rock. We have this big old rock at the University of Michigan that student groups like to paint um, and provide messages on there. And we got the opportunity to do that. And last, uh, I offer one-on-one -on -one appointments with non-traditional students to give them that opportunity to be able to reflect on their experience, to ask the questions that they need to ask, and just ultimately get them to the to the goal that they want to get, and that's getting their degree and having a wonderful experience at U of M. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Michael. Thank you, Justin. Uh, I'm just turning check. Okay, so um, uh, we do have another recruiting coordinator, Nick Trinsky, who was going to come here, but the last minute couldn't, and he runs our mentorship program, so he was going to do more on this. So I'll briefly go through this, but won't be in as much detail as if Nick was here. Um, but we have we started the mentorship program as part of our Transfer Bridges to the Humanities grant that we received from the Mellon Foundation, where we had students who had transferred from Henry Ford College it, uh, mentoring the students while they're still at Henry Ford College. Um, and providing, you know, typical mentorship conversations about the student experience and stuff like that, but also application support, which is important for our transfer students. We have a fairly, rig fairly rigorous application, requires four essays. Um, it's, we use the Common App or the Coalition App. 
For a lot of our community college students, um, a college application is a foreign genre of writing, right? They're like, I don't know. I don't like to write about myself, things like that. Um, and so our mentors can help them through that. So through that, being successful with the grant program, we begun to expand that. And so this fall, we expanded it to offering the mentorship to any community college student who was interested. And we have 24 transfer ambassadors. Almost all of them did transfer from a, from a Michigan community college. We have one who transferred from an out-of-state community college. Um, and so we, when students sign up for a mentorship program, they're assigned a mentor, and then that mentor does everything I just said. And our application deadline was just yesterday for the fall semester. So our mentors have been really busy. Um, it's been a great experience for our mentors. Um, and again, it's a new thing, so we, we don't have data or anything like that. But just the way they talk about their interactions with their mentees, uh, you can tell it means a lot to them. And so to talk about the two sides of the bridges and what people get out of these things, the mentees are obviously getting that support, but our ambassadors are also getting a lot out of that experience. And so it's, I think it's been a great experience for them. Uh, we have currently this semester, we have, I think, 67 uh, students in the mentorship program. With our number of ambassadors, we actually think we have a capacity to do 150 students a semester through the mentorship program. Uh, we do have a small component for four years, uh, students coming from four-year schools. We only have a few of our ambassadors who transferred from four-year schools, so we didn't want to open it up totally for four-year students because we really only had three of the ambassadors who could have done it and they would have been overwhelmed. So we, we did a little bit of group advising, had them do group mentorship and things like that. Um, but it's mainly uh, focused for community college students. So it's been really, we feel like it's been really successful. Like I said, we don't have data yet, um, but it was successful on a smaller scale when we were doing it as part of the grant. Um, and so we're continuing to, to um, ex uh, expand that and hopefully by you know, the next cohort that we bring into the mentorship program will be able to get up to closer to our capacity limits because we really would like to serve more students to do all the things that Dallas, like Dallas mentioned about the peer-to-peer -peer and all that. We think that's really important. And that's all we have for you. So any questions? They are paid, yes. So we currently have 24 ambassadors. And we, for the, when we hired them this year, we promised them at, t at least 10 hours a week so that they could count it as an actual job. So, we do not. No, we don't. Right, and because and, and, we have really great relationships with some of our TRIO pro students success support services at our community colleges. One of the reasons why we, GRCC is one of our new partners in the grant is because we've had a relationship with their TRIO program since I started. When I started in this position, their TRIO director was bringing students to campus every fall. Um, and, and so she was already doing that. So from that's the relationship that now we have, they're a partner in our mailing grant. And that's solely because of our relationship with TRIO, but we don't have that on campus. We do have, Student support, we have a comprehensive studies program which um, students can be, some students are admitted into it or students can affiliate with it. It's a sort of more high impact advising model, things of that sort. They have uh, free tutoring available for students in classes and stuff like that. So there are some things like that but not, not an official trio type. So we are, we are amazingly fortunate that our leadership, Dr. Ping talked about the leadership by and right. We, our leadership in, in the College of Literature Sites has bought into this from the very beginning. So the Transfer Student Center, you know, I don't have a story about advocacy for the Transfer Student Center, even though myself and a few others on campus who were working, sort of did the most work with transfer students, were advocating for it. Our Associate Dean, Angela Lane, uh, Dillard, Angela, almost said her name wrong, Angela Dillard, um, she was kind of interested in it, and you know what she did? She met with students. She goes, can you, enter, can you, set me up to talk to some transfer students. She came out at like two conversations with groups of transfer students and said, okay, that room's gonna be a transfer student center. Now, the space was available in the newly renovated building. There was a space that they didn't quite know what they were gonna do with, and so they were looking for a purpose for that space. So we were lucky that this space existed. 
but it really was the students. The students convinced the leadership that this would make a difference in their experience, okay? So, so, so all of our recruitment efforts, U of M is very decentralized, right? And so there's different applications for every single college. Um, some of us, a few of us use the Common App, a number of others have their own application, um, different general degree requirements. So we're very decentralized. So any of our efforts in recruiting, particularly in recruiting, because that transfer credit and the information about how their credit's gonna count for their degree is so vitally important to the student, um, we, we can't like cross over and, and tell students. So we do have a group on campus of everybody from all the schools and colleges that works with transfer students and we meet regularly. Um, but, if, if we're at, but if we're at a school where someone says I want engineering or I want public health or something like that, we can refer them directly to a person at that school. Um, but but we, now obviously any transfer students welcome to come to hang out in the center. We don't, we don't, we don't make them, we ask them, do ask them to swipe in, but there's not a red beep if they're an engineering student or anything like that, so. Yes, and so um, we do separate them a little bit. Um, and so a non-traditional student it can be a transfer student, uh, but a transfer student might not be a non-traditional student. And so we use a definition from the, um, oh, I'm, I'm blanking on it right now. Um, but, uh, but basically with our, uh, w at the College of LSA, we base it just on age right now because we've recognized that there is, um, uh, like a, um, when it comes to determining, we're looking like we cannot determine anywhere in the information that we get provided for transfer students any other aspect except for age. So right now it's 24 years or older. But if I if a student comes to me and they meet any other parts of like a non-traditional student definition, like a caregiver over the age of 24, um, have a gap in um, school, they um, they uh, have a GED or uh, uh, come from a community college, something like that, then they're absolutely, they come in. But right now, just to like identify them right away, we just strictly go by age. And military veterans too, or automatically, even though most of them are 24 when you get to us. So, um, and those are the definitions that we use to do outreach for the non-traditional student. So when we email students, that's sort of the data that we run. We actually have no way of finding a student parent on campus. Um, that's not recorded anywhere that we can find, so we don't have a way to invite parents, uh, which is kind of a big flaw in the data. So. Right, so so we we have U of M Ann Arbor, U of M Dearborn, U of M, and U of M Flint. Um, they're all part of the U of M system, though they operate pretty much separately. So students from those campuses actually apply as external transfer students, just like any other student. Um, the only difference is their grades transfer. It's the only two schools where their grades actually transfer because they already have a U of M GPA. So that, that stays with them. Um, and they are actually, U of M Dearborn is one of our biggest feeder schools, if you want to call it that, just because a lot of students there. We at one point had a, a, a set up program for students who could be come out of high school and go to Dearborn with a guaranteed transfer as long as they got a certain GPA in their first year. Uh, that program ended a couple years ago. So we don't really have any specific agreements with those um, those campuses. Um, and they don't really operate like satellite campuses either. They're separate institutions that sort of the U of M presidents there, but then after below that, they operate completely separately from Ann Arbor. So right, we're probably we out of time? I think, well, we're out of time, we're over time, sorry. So if anybody has any other questions for us, we'll be around.